Hi, my name is Seal. I'm at Amoeba, and this is what is in my bag. See, this is what happened. I got in here and I just went for box sets because I couldn't believe it being surrounded by all this great art. So this is by an artist that you can't not have, basically. Well, as is pretty much everything in my, in my bag. But this is the uh, Harvest 50th Anniversary Deluxe Edition. So it's on it. Uh, out on the weekend. Okay, Harvest, a man needs a maid. Love that song. <laughs> Talk about a man pouring his heart out, an artist pouring his heart out on that track. Heart of God, are you ready? Old Man, one of my favorites. Neil Young was a kind of a later discovery for me because I was a huge fan of CSN. And of course, it was Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young, but then I, I later came to appreciate. Neil Young and I love pretty much everything he's done but this is essential this would be I think for anyone getting into Neil Young that I mean it's pretty much there's enough here so I'll segue from Neil Young to Deja Vu if I had ever been in before on another time around the wheel I would probably know just how to deal with all of you this has great memories for me this album and the first Crosby Stills and Nash album Deja Vu came second and on it, we have Carry On. Carry On is a great track, great, great, and a very significant track for me because Crosby, Stills & Nash were one of the bands that formed a template for my first albums. Mm -hmm. Well, my first album. I wrote a song called Deep Water. That was really a collection of three songs or three ideas that I somehow convinced Trevor could be one song. Trevor being my producer, Trevor Horn. I tell you we'll find a way holding the sun. But that idea came to me because I was listening to Crosby, Stills and Nash's Carry On which, you know, one morning I woke up. That's the first part, and that's... One morning I woke up, and I knew I'd be alone. One morning Then it breaks. Carry on, love is coming. This kind of percussionless section. And then it goes on into the, into a, another section. So it's like three different parts. It's like three different acts of a play. CSN were the, the band that gave me permission to do that, mm -hmm. to, to, to not think of songs in a kind of linear left to right fashion, that they could be as experimental and, and as long as it all came from, from uh, this place of adventure and, and from the heart, as long as it all came from that, you could do anything, anything was possible. Luckily for me, I, I ended up with a producer who entertained all of my madness and, uh, you know, anyway. But then there's Our House on this. Oh, God, I like it. That's a song that I play with uh, my love all the time. That's our song. Our house is a very, very, very fine house. Because the lyrics are just so beautiful. Our house is a very, very fine house with two cats in the yard. Life used to be so hard. Now everything is easy because of you. I think those of us who are lucky enough to feel that, you know, we'll, we'll be touched by this song. Okay, let's kind of jump ahead for a bit now. Alice in Chains. I feel so alone, gonna end up a big old
but Facelift was the first one and it had Man in a Box. This band were really significant for me because when I left England at the beginning of my career, grunge had just, had just, be, had just kicked off. I remember coming to Los Angeles and being in a cab and talking to the driver and we got talking about music and he said, well, what kind of music do you like? Or what are you interested in? And I said, well, I, I'm, I'm really curious about this grunge thing and like it's really, I really like it. And he said, who are the bands? I said, oh, I, I, you know, I, I love kind of Nirvana and of course, and I love, I like Pearl Jam. And he says, well, he said, oh, they're cool. Have you heard of this band called Alice in Chains? And I went, well, no. And he put on Man in a Box and that was it. I heard Lane's voice, Lane and Jerry singing together with those close harmonies and yes. And so out of that whole grunge period, they were by far, by far my favorite. And I think the most underrated Alice in Chains. And there were some great songs on here, like oh, the obvious one being Rooster, and you know, which Jerry wrote about his father coming home from Vietnam. Yeah, here come the rooster. Yeah. I love <clears throat> the artistry, obviously, but the, there's a real sexiness to that music. It's dark, it's beautiful, it's melancholic, but it's really sexy and it's, it's weighty. But they had something that all of those other bands that from that era, that, that grunge era, they had something truly unique. Like they had a soul that was almost like an R&B type soul that uh, even though it didn't sound like R&B, but that, that guttural soul, as opposed to just kind of being in your head, hen head, hence headbanger. They had stuff that got you right down here. And I, and I love, I lo I, I'm a big fan of, of Alice in Chains and, and Lane's voice and his approach, God rest his soul. Then, uh, okay, then we can go here. Kate Bush, Hounds of Love. it has uh, is it running up that hill was that in Stranger Things or something you know and people are kind of discovering her but my favorites are the first one the kick inside which had uh, man with the child in his eyes and Wuthering Heights <laughs> Even the later ones, uh, the one that has a pie on it. Beautiful album, I can't remember what it's called now. Three. God, they're great songs on here. Mother Stands for Comfort. They're all cloud busting, Big Sky. Up until fairly recently, she has been such an unsung hero. I often refer to her as, as our greatest, she's a national treasure, and she's our greatest export, I think, Kate Bush, largely because she's, she's been unsung up until now. But those who know, know. And if you don't know, now you know, in the words of Biggie. If you don't know, now you know, you know. David, pretty much the same. He was magical, a huge influence in my life both um, as a friend and, and as an artist. Hugely influential. Um, five years. Well, I'm somebody, people. I never thought I'd need so many people. I have a song called Don't Cry on my second album. That was influenced by five years. We were older then. Lived a life without any doubt. Anyway, five years. I love this record, Ziggy Stardust. I picked this one out. Let us kneel down in the old time way. He will hear us and be, we'll be red from. He will feed us until we want no more. 
and spectacular, like the wealth of education and information in the music that she put out and her as an artist, for anyone aspiring to be an artist, male or female, is breathtakingly overwhelming. This is her at, in, in her most kind of pure and raw form. <laughs> Aretha Franklin's Amazing Grace, the complete recordings. I just love it. My earliest memories of music, were, my mother was a, a, a wig maker in the 60s. I was born in 63, and she was really into Motown, and of course, Aretha Franklin and, and Dionne Warwick and, and Stevie Wonder. So my earliest memories sitting under her sewing machine were her playing Aretha Franklin and Dionne Warwick. I couldn't find any Dionne Warwick, but I'll come back for that. Uh, this guy, well, this guy in this album, uh, I often refer to him as the Tone King. All things and what they um, he is perhaps my favorite voice of all time, uh, simply because he just never oversang. And the information, he didn't have to do any of those like vocal gymnastics, even though he could, but because he, Marvin could just sing one note and his whole DNA and everything you wanted to know about what was going on in the world, pardon the pun, or pun intended, uh, was in that one note. There was so much information in, in the tone of his voice that, that allowed you in, it, you just felt everything. My God, like what an instrument mm -hmm. that he was given. Like what a voice, and some people are just blessed with that he was. And in terms of, of singing, he and Sinatra are, are, are who I aspire to, these two. Then, oh, the last one. This next album turned me from uh, wanting to be someone who wrote and sang nice songs to somebody who wanted to be a recording artist that made albums that affected people's lives and subsequently could potentially make the world a better place. This, in my opinion, is the perfect album. Mm. And it's Stevie Wonder's Inner Visions. I'm too high, too high, but ain't too It is absolutely flawless, flawless. It starts with too high. It, again, it's a device, you know. You just haven't heard anything. And he goes, I'm too high, too high, never gonna touch the ground. And it's like, okay, well, where? And then he goes into visions. Do we have to find our wings and fly away to the vision in our mind? And that's real introspective. It's down tempo, but totally engaging, but possible at that point of the record because Too High is such an audio, it's like a sensory assault. Like you, you haven't heard anything like it. It was unlike anything he was doing before. And visions, it's his visions are of a utopia, a perfect world of how it could be. And then of course, you know, because he's taken the liberty with visions, he doesn't want, doesn't want to leave you there too much. And remembering that this is a journey, then he goes into the classic, the banger of bangers, living for the city. I mean, come on. So in, in summary, this was the most profound album of, not my career, but my life. This is the one that made me understand uh, what I wanted to do with my life. Uh, this is the album that gave me permission to do what I wanted to do with my life. This is the album that made me look at the world in a, in a different way. And I think everyone has that album. 
uh, and those people who uh, will watch this will know what that album is. This was mine. Stevie Wonder's Inner Visions. Thank you so very much. We could talk to you for hours about music. Thank you very Thank much. You. The digital age has robbed people of an essential part of this connection between the recording artist and the listener, which is perceived value. Mm -hmm. I remember when I'd save up all the money I had with my group of friends, you know, and the new, you know, Stevie Wonder album would come out or the new whatever would come out. and we'd kind of buy, we, you know, or we'd kind of scratch together and we'd buy one album and then we'd get it back and we'd kind of get back, you know, to one of our flats and, and we'd all sit around and listen and, you know, pass the liner notes around. Mm -hmm. That was essential because even if, even if the record didn't immediately grab you, there was this thing of perceived value well, I've bought it, or we have bought it, therefore we are going to engage. We're going to be, it, it, it's valuable, it means something. We're holding it, it's physical. And so we tended to be a lot more patient with music as a result of this perceived value. As a recording artist, we then made records like that. We had the luxury of the album track. It wasn't meant to be a single, it was just meant to be really good. And in actual fact, it was meant to be the track that after you had been kind of wowed by the singles, the, the album track, because it was a slow burn, that was the one that became your favorite track because it was the one that you kind of, there was a sense of discovery about it. It kind of drew you in. And the more you listened to it, every time you listened to it, you heard something new. So. Th those are just some of the emotions I'm feeling by coming into uh, a record store at last. Oh,